Hiya Richard, hiya Linda. Hi. Um, I've just, we've come here today uh, to see what you've been organising. Yeah. Uh, John Dean asked us if we'd come along and film it for you. We're from the Outward Community Video Group in Wakefield and we filmed a miners reunion for him a few weeks ago at the British Legion Club. So it's sort of a little followed up. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about today. Today is an event held at Sherburn Aero Club. Um, really it's an open day for Sherburn Village and the other villages around and about showing what the Aero Club is about. It's also um, uh, to show what um, the cadet force of uh, 2434 Squadron at Church Fenton do. Um, and it's to raise money for Help for Heroes, the charity. And Linda's very heavily involved in that. So if you'd like... Over to you, Linda. Yeah, I'm the fundraiser for uh, 2434 Church Fenton Air Cadets. Um, we've ra last year we raised 7,500 for Help for Heroes on this day. Um, we had quite a high target this year, but we go out fundraising to, so the children can go on projects and trips out. Um, they've been to Canada and France, and they do all the air shows, and they, they always marshal up at Sherburn Aero Club. Thank you for that. You really do some good work in the Help the Heroes, I'm sure of that. And people will appreciate it in families. And thank you once again for letting us come to your show. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I wonder if you'd just tell me a little bit what you're doing here today. Uh, a little bit about your fire engine. I understand you're based at Tadcaster and how long it would take if you, to attend a fire here from Tadcaster. Yeah, hello. Um, Right, well we've been asked by Sherman Aero Club, uh, we've come to quite a few of their events so uh, it's quite useful for us to come down and have a look around uh, the airfield as well and just be uh, involved in the community sort of side of uh, the event. Uh, really people have a look around the fire engine, see what sort of equipment we carry, the different things that we do, we talk to people, tell them about the role and uh, the various sort of incidents and type of things that we can go to looking at the equipment that we carry. Um, from Tagcaster, yeah we're Probably takes us depending on uh, on the traffic. We can probably get here within about seven minutes uh, in traffic time. Um, but as long as we've got a good clear run, um, the type of station that we've got at Takas, we've got uh, two different first line appliances like this one then we have what uh, we call a heavy rescue unit there so the area that we deal with we deal with quite a lot of road traffic collisions heavy rescue type incidents with heavy goods vehicles uh, and playing some of the equipment that we carry we've got uh, we have or had a, a foam based uh, unit tanker so which is now disbanded um, but it's now classed as a water tanker so we've got capabilities for any type of incident that sort of happens in this area and we can work and use some of the equipment that the, uh, the fire crews carry here as well we can sort of take over some of their equipment and ours will work in conjunction with theirs so if there was an incident here we could basically use our equipment with theirs as well John, it's a lovely day today to have this uh, this thing what you're doing today for Help the Heroes. Now, I was most surprised when I found an old collier and an ex-deputy who goes flying. I only go flying when it's my holiday, so can you tell us a little bit about your aeroplane, your flying and what you're doing today? Well, I, I always wanted to be a pilot, but as you can imagine, being a, a, a collier, it's not something you'd expect to do from uh, working down a coal mine to, to being a pilot of an aeroplane. So I came along and had a look at uh, learning to fly, saw how much it was going to cost and uh, quickly exited and uh, waited till my me, me son had grown up a little bit and had a little bit more money when the mortgage were getting paid off. Came back, uh, told my wife I was just going to come and make some inquiries. Four hours later I was uh, two hours into my pilot's licence and uh, quite a lot more uh, short of money after that ever since. Right, I just, I'm just sat here now uh, looking at all these dials and I'm thinking bloody hell I've enough watch it speedometer in car and 
And how do you go on with all these? A lot of them for the type of flying we do, which is called VFR flying, which is in good weather like we've got today. A lot of them don't really need to be used. A lot of them are navigation instruments, so most of these are for finding your way around in the sky. The main ones we do tend to use is the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, which tells us how high we're at. The vertical speed into which says we're climbing or we're descending and an RPM gauge same as you have in your car. The rest of the things are just radios for talking to air traffic control and uh, engine instruments such as uh, oil pressures and temperatures and fuel. It's, you've mesmerised me with all these, I mean uh I'd be lost, I wouldn't know which to remember. Obviously I don't think you're in mining now, are you? No, 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 I, I, uh, I, I finished after uh, 1996 and bought a fish and chip shop. But uh, most of the time I spend time here helping out, uh, you know, doing the promotions for Sherburn. It's been smashing talking to you and I've never sat in a cockpit before. Uh, it's absolutely marvellous and thank you once again. You're welcome, yeah, it's nice talking to you. Hiya Jim, I'm Tony Banks from the Outward Community Video Group in Wakefield. I just wonder if you could tell us a little about your car and what you're doing here today. Yeah, pleased to meet you Tony. Uh, I'm here really because it's helped the heroes to really support that effort. Uh, I live fairly local at Ackworth near Pontefract. Uh, the car you're looking at is a 1952 Sunbeam Alpine. Uh, I bought it in 1978, it had, at that stage it was a bit of a wreck, it had been through all the boy races and it had had the back cut out and made into a 2 plus 2. Uh, I restored it and, he, and put it back to how it should be uh, and put it on the road in 1980. So what you see is really it's been on road since 1980 so it's it's done 20, 28 to 9 years since then, so it's, it's had a long and hard life. Uh, the, the only other epic thing I've ever done with it, that me and Brenda, my wife, we, we got into about 10 years ago with the top down. We went 3,850 mile round trip to Cape St Vincent in as far southwest in Spain as you can go, and we never had the top up. Uh, with two little incidents, that's all, a broken spring on the throttle and a, a puncture in all that period. And all we had in the back of the car was just an Asda bag with one or two bits and pieces in. No, no backup. Well, we, we had breakdown cover, uh, but we didn't, we didn't go in a convoy or anything like that. They don't make cars like that today, Jim, do they? No, but I, my answer to that usually is it's a good job because you and I probably couldn't afford one if they did. <laughs> These cars used to spend three weeks in the factory. They're lucky if they spend half an hour nowadays. And that does reflect in what they would cost, of course. They couldn't afford to make a car like that and sell it. I mean, you're going back to an ear. I mean, if you want to go back to the 30s and a car costs what a small house costs, yeah. You, you know, you and I wouldn't, just won't be able to afford them, so it's a bit of a fallacy. They don't make cars like they used to do, and it's a good job they don't. It's a good job they've improved on them over years. I used to drool over these cars when I was a lad in the 50s, but we couldn't afford them, could we? Well, that's exactly why you buy a car like this. Yeah. Uh, I bought this car because when I was 22 and had a Ford console, my first car, I really would have preferred one of these, but I couldn't afford it. So we, we're we all stricken with the same bug, basically. Anyway, thanks for that, Jim, and keep on motoring. Very good, thank you, Tony. Hiya, Gary. It's a nice day for you, a bit windy, but uh, there's a good turnout. Can you tell us a bit about your cars? Yeah, the cars are, are kit cars, actually a Cobra replica. 
this one behind the blue one is actually built on an old Sierra. Yeah. But it's actually got an American engine in, which is a 5.7 litre V8, which gives a roughly about 340 brake horse, which on a car that weighs 870 kilos is it's quite a good weight to ratio, power to ratio. It does a roughly 12 to 18 miles to a gallon if okay. you're really gently. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it's all about the noise, it's not about the speed, mm. it's the noise of the cars and it, it's just when they go out they do attract crowds and it's, it's about meeting people as well because yeah. you know there's a lot of these cars around and you know and it's good to see a lot of cars at these shows anyway because you know this is what brings people in and, yeah. and the pride and joy is in the cars and it's nice like I say to meet people and talk to people about the cars. Excuse me sir. Can you tell me a little bit about this Mercedes, what you own? I can't, I'm sorry, but it isn't mine. It's my friend's. And I'm just sat in it having a go. You've always wanted one of these, oh, haven't you? definitely, I always wanted one of these, but we couldn't afford it, could we? I knew you when you had dinghy toys. <laughs> I wish I still had them. <laughs> anyway, what are you doing here today? We've come to support the show. That's very good. It's nice to see a money man on the job. Uh, yes, two of us. That makes two <laughs> of us then, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the interview, Thank Dennis. Thank you very much, sir. Hiya, Stuart. It's a nice day today for you with your car. Can you tell me a little bit about it and what you're doing here today? Well, um, I like to come to rallies. I'm 89 now. Oh, yeah. And uh, I've had this car since 1967. October 1967 and uh, it's, I've kept it on road and uh, as far as I know it's never been off the road since it was first purchased in 1951 1st of January 1951 that's when it was registered on road what we're doing here today well I worked on aircraft all during the war, and uh, it's nice to come and uh, and see uh, the aircraft and uh, and that. Um, what what can I tell you about the car? Well, it's um, an Armstrong Sidley, 1951, as I said. Uh, these cars were made just after the war and they're all named after aircraft. This car I'm sitting in is a Whitley. The others were the Hurricane, which was a drophead, a Typhoon, which was a two-door uh, two with a hard top, and a Tempest, which was a very, uh, if there's any left now, they're very rare. I knew there was one years ago, a chap used to come to club meetings with his, with his Tempest and that was a nice car, but what's happened to it since them days I don't know. Uh, I used to use it, I used to use this car every day when I was working, I used to go to work in it every day and it was always on the road, no trouble whatsoever. We've done quite, it's had one or two renovations done uh, uh, over years and uh, it's been resprayed and one thing and another like that just to keep it in, in somewhat like condition. But it's never been really bottomed, I've never had it to pieces to say that it's been bottomed and from built renew from bottom up. I bet you've been envy of all your work mates when you drove to work in this. Yeah well probably so but uh, I don't know has anybody ever bothered about it really it was just it was just there and that was it. They, they didn't uh, and even today people are not really interested. I don't th I don't know how far interest goes in a, 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 lot, a lot of people uh, f for uh, what were built years ago and, uh, and how, how they come to be uh, how, how these things come to be about because uh, there were quite a few uh, 
Rolls Royce we know and people like that who were interested in motor cars and and, uh, and things that uh, and uh, even with aircraft uh, they've the produced aeroplanes and uh, and things like that Anyway, thanks for that interview, Jim. It's been really interesting and I, I wish you many happy years of motoring in this car. And thank you very much. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Ah, Andy, I'm back again. Uh, I used to work at Wistow Colliery and I come out here in 1970s. Uh, 1978, in fact, and there was always lots of motorbikes in Sherburn area going up to the A1 from the cafe. Do you have a lot of trouble or do you help a lot of these motorbikes out? Yeah, well... I'm a motorcyclist myself, so I know the area very well, but yeah, it's Squires Cafe Bar, and it is, if you look in the motorcycle magazines, it's classed as one of the best places in the north of England for motorcyclists to meet, and the roads around here, they, they are perfect roads, they're, they're long, they're windy, bendy roads, and it is perfect motorcycling uh, conditions, but we do get a lot of road traffic accidents where are involving motorcyclists and unfortunately we get quite a lot of fatalities with motorcyclists around the area. As far as when we get involved, depending on the type of incident, if it's a single motorcyclist we don't tend to get involved that much but if the motorcyclist crashes into a car or something and they might have trapped the car driver then that's when we come in. But we do try and do a lot to try and combat um, speeding motorcyclists. Well, we regularly hold events down at Squires Coffee Bar where we'll turn up and we'll have a lot of community safety advice and stalls. Um, and we just try and educate people really to some of the consequences of what, what can happen. I mean, we do see horrific sights from motorcycle accidents. And as I say, as a motorcyclist myself, I know what can happen. So it, it does slow me down. I still enjoy my motorcycle. I still enjoy riding around on these roads. But the type of things that I see, it does tend to to reduce my speed when I'm riding around and that's the try message that we put across to all other motorcyclists really. Anyway, thanks again and uh, what would we do without you? You've got a busy job. Thank you very much.